That, that's fantastic, George. Uh, but let me ask you this. Uh, I know you're a fan of Carl Sagan's, uh, just like I am. Uh, isn't that in a way kind of criticizing and or undermining his work? And he was a very sort of a visionary, very long-term looking kind of guy uh, who was really, in, in my opinion, he was not just a mere scientist. He was like a I would call him both an artist and a philosopher because he was both artistic in the way he was able to communicate his message and inspire us and also very philosophical in the sense that he could dive deeply into the implications of the uh, uh, of all of those uh, dimensions of the cosmos and so on. So what I'd say is... Um... I would not be sitting here opposite you if it wasn't for Carl Sagan. It's as simple as that. I mean, probably one of the most formative thinkers on uh, on my in my life, particularly when I was a teenager, and it just set the whole you know path for me in terms of you know scientific inquiry and even thinking uh, from so, you know a cosmological perspective and even an interest in uh, in, in SETI. Uh, absolutely, but I think I, I would disagree with your uh, use of the language and saying that I, you know me and others are working to undermine him or under, undermine his mission. I think um, you know we are scientists and we're coming at this from a scientific perspective, which is um, you know, constantly working to improve our knowledge and under, get a better understanding of systems and, and models. And if anything, I think uh, Sagan, uh, from what I uh, what I know of him, he would probably tr you know present you know some counter arguments. You know, uh, to, to continue to maybe uphold his particular opinions on it. But ultimately, you know, the more the most efficacious and the uh, the, and, and the, the most valid of arguments will be the ones that survive. That's the scientific method. So if anything, I think, uh, again, I don't, I don't necessarily like the, the choice of language by saying undermining. I'd say we're engaging in the scientific uh, discourse that Carl Sagan would be 100% behind of, even if it meant contradicting his own ideas. Um, now, similarly, though, I do, uh, as much as I respect Carl Sagan, as much as he continues to be a hero for me, I, I do disagree with some of his, um, some of his assumptions, particularly... Uh, him coming from the perspective of the uh, the so-called uh, SETI optimists. SETI optimists, both in terms of uh, his denial of the Fermi paradox, um, and secondly, his uh, his interpretation that uh, that ETIs would be friendly uh, by default. Uh, I think both of those presuppositions are potentially uh, wrong and dangerous, yeah. and that uh, the Fermi paradox is already indicating to us very strongly that there's probably no hope in hell that we will ever have a of, uh, of uh, detecting the signs of extraterrestrial intelligence. Um, if we are going to find signs of ETIs, they will be the, of the non-colonizing type, which is why I think our paper on Dysonian study still remains valid. Um, but we won't, but uh, the, the galaxy is old enough, it's ancient enough, and life could have emerged so long ago that it could have been colonized by now thousands of times over. And a uh, common objection to this, to this particular stance is that, well, yeah, they could have Absolutely, you're right, George. You know, colonization may not be what you think. They could have just come and gone, and we'd never see their signs ever again. But uh, I disagree completely with that because I do believe it violates the uh, intelligence principle, which is that if, a, if an intelligence does start a colonization wave, it will irrevocably alter uh, the fabric of the galaxy itself, and it will begin to convert it into a Kardashev three-scale galaxy. And uh, that's the clue that not happened. Uh, uh, our galaxy is clearly still very much in a, in a natural state, unperturbed state, uh, and uh, uh, I think that uh, there is, it's, been, it's been clear that no colonization wave has made its way through the, the Milky Way galaxy at this point, and, and perhaps maybe through none of the galaxies in the universe, which is a rather bizarre conclusion to make, and uh, hopefully you know, we'll have some insight into, into that at some point. But uh, and then similarly, we, we uh, the other con the other argument or uh, problem with Sagan was his uh, contact optimism in terms of the be uh, the uh, you know the benevolence of ETIs, and this is where, for example, a thinker like David Brin would agree with me that we need to be very wary of shouting out in the cosmos, so to speak, which is another which is another which is another sign of SETI. Why, by the way, another reason why uh, Dysonian SETI and SETI proper are good is because it's it's somewhat it's passive, is that we're just listening and looking. And that we're not making our presence known, but there is a group of, uh, um, I guess, SETI advocates or whatever even what you would call them, known as active SETI, that they've actually already started transmitting uh, signals out into the cosmos that are meant to get the attention of ETIs. And uh, uh, David Brin is one of the more vocal opponents of this. And he's not making any grand claim. He's not claiming e aliens are good or bad. He's saying, hold off on this because we have no idea. If uh, we could, uh, you know, get some undue, uh, you know, attention, uh, like you said, shouting out in the uh, jungle, so to speak, as it could bring in some pretty terrible lions and tigers and bears that we're not uh, ready to deal with right now. So, but thankfully, that's not, uh, well, 
I shouldn't say thankfully, because there actually are active attempts to do this, particularly by some Russian groups. And uh, I think Bryn and myself, we've, we've talked together about setting up even something like a treaty or something to get global cooperation on the matter. We think it's that serious. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so that's, yeah, uh, that's my little thing about Sagan. Uh, I think it's a fair question, but uh, yeah, it's uh, all part of moving forward and, and you know, adopting new ideas and new techniques to get better answers. So, George, uh, for all those uh, viewers and listeners uh, today who don't know much about you and would like to find out more about what you do and your work, what's the best place to go and visit you? Uh, there's a couple places. Um, one is my blog, obviously, and it's called Sentient Developments. And uh, I'm a very regular blogger there. I tend to write original articles and uh, also post from uh, some of the my favorite are, uh, you know, sites around the web, and your audience would definitely be interested in it. it, it I talk about singularity issues, artificial intelligence, and uh, futurism, and uh, and all that, all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, also, just very quickly, uh, even Twitter, that that's a good way to get get a hold of me, and that's just at Dvorsky. Um, but um, I've also uh, restarted my podcast as well. It's the Sentient Developments Podcast. I did it for a number of years, uh, like three or four years ago. But then I stopped for several years. And uh, a couple months ago, I restarted it again. And uh, uh, the format's not like yours. Yours is interview, uh, interview style. Mine is just uh, myself, just uh, going over some um, some uh, some articles that I've that I've read, or just my rants about something that's interesting me at, at any given time. But definitely, it's still in line with uh, your particular community. So I think uh, your audience would, would find some value in in that. Yeah, and, but, I, and I have to share. I'm a fan because I I'm very happy that you started your restarted your podcast, and because I had happened to fall onto a few of the older episodes, but I've also definitely been keeping up with the newer ones. Oh, nice, nice. Uh, that's glad. I'm glad to hear that. And uh, your your audience can uh, find the new podcast by simply just going to Sentient Developments. I post links to it very regularly, and there's links in, including on how to how to sign up for the RSS or iTunes or what have you. Fantastic. Let me ask you the final question here, which is: if you were to sort of wrap up and perhaps I don't know if you want to try and uh, bring together all the topics that we've discussed today. I mean, we started with the paleo diet, we went through animal rights and animal enhancement and transhumanism, and we sort of finished with SETI and, and your suggestion for a Dysonian approach to it. Um, so do you want to wrap these up uh, or, or do you want to... Yes, I can wrap it up with a, a line from Heinlein who says, specialization is for insects. Uh, and I told you I'd get that line in there, but uh, but no, I mean you know what? I, I can't. I, I say that uh, somewhat uh, tongue in cheek because uh, I mean um, I, I just think think about all the things we talked about today, and even the things that are part of my life and part of my you know my intellectual pursuits, and it's so all over the map. I think if anything, my struggle is is to kind of combine it and synthesize it into some, some kind of cohesive whole. But for me, like I said, like Highline said, specialization is kind of maybe not, not the way to go. That it's I think it's through the diversity of interests. And you know, multiplicity of uh, your activities and uh, ability to talk about you know virtually anything you know at least somewhat intelligently. I think that's the joy of life, and that's what me, that I thrive off that. But I mean, I'm sure you know, Nicola. Whenever you interview a transhumanist or any futurist, you find that you get polymaths on the show, and I think that's what makes us pretty amazing as a community. Is we're all able to. You touch on so many subjects and maybe that's why we, we're so good at seeing the big picture and maybe why that's so difficult for some of the segments of society to not look at the future in the same way that we do is I think it's this uh, ability to, to take uh, you know so much of life so much of math and science and philosophy and politics and everything and human well-being and even some spiritual uh, some spiritual notions at the same time and uh, maybe develop a big picture of what the future could be and where we could end up as a civilization and I think it's through uh, the, uh, that, that polymath, uh, diverse attitude, that, that's, what's, that's what enables us to think and do the things that we do. That's totally brilliant, George. I, I'm really enjoying that thought, and, and I'll take it away from this conversation okay. and use it myself and remember it because I really love it. <laughs> so thank you for that, and I think it would make Very a great welcome. title too. <laughs> okay. okay. So thank you for being with us on the show, George. My pleasure. Let's do it again, all right? Absolutely. Thank you.